Hey there, everybody. My name is John Hodgman, and I will be moderating this panel, uh, where I plan on mostly talking about Animal Farm. Um, so thank you all for showing up, despite kind of the, the switching of the schedule. Although, out of curiosity, which panel are you guys here to watch? <laughs> Um, this is the Disney sing-along, so I'm going to call it It's just going to be an hour of four unfortunate souls. <laughs> Extended dance remix. <laughs> so, uh, the, the bad news is, you know, we have some folks lined up who do a lot of, um, you know, memoir-ish writing, Hodgman and, and, uh, and Will. Um, and uh, now I don't have them. However, on the upside, that means that, like, we'll get to talk. To <laughs> uh, I, I say that with love in my heart, just in case they watch this on the feed later. Um, Cover those faces, man. <laughs> it also means that, like, we can now tailor this panel a little bit more to maybe what we are best suited to talk about, or just what we are the most in the mood for today. Also, we will be doing some Q&A, and so we just have a lot of flexibility here, given uh, the fluidity of the situation. It sounds like anarchy, but no, it's flexibility. <laughs> that's uh, Excellent. that's going to be the title of my autobiography right there. <laughs> uh, so I will start by just saying, my name is Pat Rothfuss. <laughs> I am nominally uh, the, the moderator of this panel, uh, which mostly means I will kind of nudge us along maybe in certain directions, and when it comes time to do Q&A, uh, you know, we could have people come up, but instead what I think I might do is when we do Q&A, so start thinking about that now, think of your question, and I'll have people raise their hands and say it, and then I'll repeat it, rather than have people come down and use the mic, that could be kind of a hassle. Um, uh, the reason I'm here is that uh, not my, my professional writing, like my novels, isn't necessarily memoir-ish, but I do a lot of talking about my own life, kind of to a extreme degree, um, more than is conventionally wise on my blog. Um, and I also talk about my life a lot. Uh, in person on panels, uh, as anyone who's ever attended Rockfest After Dark knows. Um, or if you want to check that out tonight, I do not know what it will be like, but it will be an event. Um, and now I will let my panelists introduce themselves. My name is Emily Flake. I am a writer, a cartoonist, an illustrator, a performer. I mostly do um, cartoons for The New Yorker, which are not Particular, like, you know, there's only so much autobiography I can get into a single panel gag. How many times have you been a uh, shipwreck on a desert island? Uh, at least 14, <laughs> so this is well within my wheelhouse. Um, but I also do longer form cartoons that tend to be more autobiographical. I wrote a book a couple years ago called Mama Tribe, which was essays and cartoons about parenthood. So I not only mine my life, but the lives of the person I married and the person I made. <laughs> I, I really want to get into that. I'm Ken Jennings. I'm a writer as well. Um, I write nonfiction. It's not particularly confessional. Um, I'm not like the Sylvia Plath of ex-Jeopardy champions or anything. You are now. <laughs> well, I'm going to write that now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do write about me and my family. And, you know, often it's whatever weird obsession I'm into. So often it's more... Uh, it's more confessional about like my own kind of nerdery, but uh, on social media, like Pat mentioning blogging reminded me that we are now all kind of chronic confessional oversharers, thanks to the blessing that social media has been, the unmitigated blessing that it's been for society, with, with no downsides at all. It's been fantastic. I don't know if you've been following, but it's very good. <laughs> it's going to be big, this whole social media thing. Which, re which requires a lot of people to make a lot of these decisions that previously only authors made, which is like, do I change my brother-in-law's name in the book where I say he's an alcoholic or, or, you know, whatever. Or do I flat out call my dad a dick on Twitter? 
Exactly. So that, that doesn't seem hypothetical. You, you, you would immediately have that successful. better. I mean, that's an Instagram post. <laughs> I should really have brought something to take notes on. Um, so I, I think maybe this is a decent place to start, and maybe why this is more. <laughs> oh, well, I bless you. Um, and actually, you have my favorite kind of clipboard, which is like the cheapest fifty cent kind of clipboard that you get everywhere. I am now mom of this panel. <laughs> oh no! I'm going to start. Um, like, I think that's why the panels, or like this particular topic is more than like a novelty, uh, or like, ooh, I, I wonder, I wonder how the pros decide how to talk about their life, because this is a decision that now, like, every person has to make. To what degree do you talk about your shit publicly? Um, I actually came to Twitter kind of late, um, uh, and I, by which I mean like, was it uh, 2013? So it's been forever. I've been trapped there forever. <laughs> um, but I remember somebody saying, actually it was John Stalzi, and it because it was just getting to the point where people were shitting their pants really publicly on Twitter, um, as opposed to it being like a regular event like these days. And he goes, just so you know, think of it as being at a party with your friends who you want to talk to, but you're talking really loudly and everyone else at the party can hear you. And I was like, huh, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, and so maybe I want to start there. As, you know, did you, did you social media, did you share stuff about your life in public ways before you got sort of professionally famous, or as you got more or differently, you know, like public, have you moderated, or like, how did you start and how did you get here? What have you changed? I think it was always sort of of a piece with, with what I did. I mean, I always had a certain amount of, like, filterlessness in terms of what I would write about or make cartoons about. Not for the New Yorker, they don't want my soul. <laughs> um, but. Twitter and Facebook and everything seemed like sort of a natural outgrowth of, um, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bark my heart out onto the internet. Um, but I also feel like we've been primed for this kind of mindset, you know, for the over the past 20 years of like reality television, et cetera, et cetera. People really taking like the the minutia of their everyday life um, and making it into something to be consumed. You know, so I think we all sort of live in this like, you know what is private, what am I sharing because I know this will be of interest to people, or what am I sharing versus this is helpful, it's a weird space. Yeah. Oh, you got it. I had the nightmare scenario right out of the gate. Um, I, I was still appearing on Jeopardy in 2004 when I got a phone call from the show saying there had been a kidnapping threat against my two-year-old son. Uh, so, so I'm on a game show for three months, and then the FBI is involved. And so it was a real wake-up call. Like, you know, even though I was not yet a social media overshare, you realize this is what it can, this is what it can become when you're a public figure, and that includes being a, a, a writer, a YouTuber, social media figure, whatever. Um, it, it turned out to be as close to nothing as it could be. I mean, nobody likes the FBI to say your two-year-old's getting kidnapped. I mean, it's, it's not a fun day. But what it turned out to be was um, some guy in the Bay Area annoyed with his Jeopardy fan roommate, so he sent a fake letter, like, signed the roommate's name, and saying, like, I hate Ken Jennings, I'm going to kidnap his kids, signed my roommate, Jeff, you know. That's a joke he'll never do again. Hilarious. Yeah, he got, he got a visit. Christ. He got a visit from G-Man, if they, if they still have G-Man. I don't know. Do wow. they have G-Man? So, but it did make me think that, like, when you're on TV and you tell a funny story, and you, that it's a decision you need to make. Do I have children when I'm public can? Do I name them? Are they in photos? Are they pixelated out? I mean, how long is that sustainable? It's, so it's not just a matter of, like, you know, an awkward family reunion, these decisions. Like, they're real-world consequences. You know, 
I, I hadn't thought about it actually because I'm like, well, you know, I got on Twitter, I got on Facebook. And then as you guys were answering, I'm like, actually, I started this before the internet. Uh, here comes old man Rothfuss. I started it certainly before I was a professional in, in the, the sense I am now, but I wrote for the campus paper starting back in 93. I'm old, I'm oh, so old. Um, and, oh, uh, a paper. <laughs> it's actually paper, um, which is uh, it's like this. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I and I wrote uh, what was uh, ostensibly a humor column where I would kind of tell. I, I had a what I refer to as a fictionalized Pat Rothfuss, who would make a bunch of outrageous humor. And of course, I was in my early twenties. Uh, and I was a white guy. So you put those three things together, it's like, I'm funny. I'm a little white guy in the Midwest who doesn't have a lot of friends who aren't like me. And then uh, suddenly I have a tiny bit of fame. And that's made me continually cringe over the last 20 years of social media as I watch everyone else fuck up in the way that I did before the internet. Uh, because I made some jokes that I thought were super funny and that other people were like, actually this is kind of hurtful and bad and it promotes bad social ideas. And I'm like, you don't understand humor. I'm a satirist. I am invulnerable, you know, to, to your criticism. And luckily, uh, I did this in a tiny microcosm of a campus paper. Um, but it's sort of, I got those mistakes out of the way. Um, I also got a tiny bit inoculated to fame because this small college town and this little paper, uh, it, it did get read and people liked my column. And I, I once had a pizza guy show up at my house and say, are you the Pat Rothfuss? <laughs> and of course, this is 10 years before like my book was published. Maybe, gosh, more, way more than that. And, and I was like, well, well, yes, I am, you know, and I'm like, ooh, how delicious, I want that. But then I, I was sharing, I was sharing pieces of my life with the feeling like there was no consequence, because as much as, like, Instagram or Twitter might feel kind of disposable, they're super not, not in the way that an old campus paper was, where it's printed and then it's recycled, and unless somebody has a scrapbook, you know, and a weird, creepy shrine to you, um, that's never going to be seen anywhere else. Um, so, like, I wrote, I'm like, I'm like, here's a funny thing that happened to me in my first proctology exam. And, and as I was writing, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is funny. Should I even, oh, it doesn't matter. And so I made some of those choices long, long ago, which I think is part of the reason I haven't screwed up really bad publicly yet. But, I don't know. Well, are these mistakes available in an archive? Yeah, everybody's interested in that. Which university library would we go to? to uh... <laughs> it's, I actually, I, we did a compilation of them. I was, actually, my first publication was your illustrated, annotated college survival guide about Patrick Rothfuss. There were 500 copies. Um, please do not try to go buy them on eBay. Um, and we, I still have a handful of them, and I used to give them away for my charity. But even though I went in and made a bunch of annotations, and I'm like, ha ha, this wasn't a funny joke at all, I kind of don't want it out there, you know? Microfiche is forever, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want to touch on this family stuff. You, you mentioned your kid. You mentioned mining, mining your life and the life of, of the ones you love. How, how did that start with, like, has that changed? What, what was the choice that you made, Ken, after that, like, hideous fucking introduction? How do you, what, how do you decide how to talk about your people online or what to share? 
it's tricky, and it's tricky. It's in it, they're in books as well. You know, you, you kind of immortalize them. And some people make the decision that my kids don't have names and faces, and that's honestly pretty smart. But that ship had kind of already sailed for me before I realized you could you could decide that. Um, so for better or for worse, my kids had names and faces. And, you know, there are some upsides to the fact that there are now funny stories about my kids out there in my books, uh, on my, you know, blog that was, or on social media. Like, they're delighted by that. And sometimes their friends will, you know, they're in high school now, or middle school, and their friends will search my blog and find funny things they did as little kids. And maybe I would have been mortified, but um, it seems like in general there's some enjoyment around the fact that that their childhoods exist in a way that our people of our generation right. did not have. That's comforting to hear because my, <laughs> my child is now seven, and I don't really know what, if any, if there's going to be any fallout from her featuring, you know, fairly prominently, obviously in the book I wrote about being a mom. <laughs> um, that book will be long out of print by the time she gets to middle school. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to be careful. Like I was trying to mostly write benign, funny things my kids were saying or doing, you know, there's a whole series called Bewildering Conversations with a Four-Year-Old, where I would just make sure I, I noted down funny things they did and said, didn't want to forget. And now they, you know, their friends still enjoy this because it's part of the public record. Right. But, uh, you know, but really, that's a person who's someday going to have a tummy. They don't have a lot when they're three or four or seven, but someday they should have the ability to decide that, and I've kind of taken that away. And this was a huge thing for me because I had been doing social media for a while, and writing publicly, and I was aware that it kind of, it was out there and things could go sideways before I had a kid. <clears throat> and because, and because I overthink everything and I catastrophize, I really went down a rabbit hole in my head about whether or not it was ethical for me to, because like, if, you know, I have a funny story about my partner, I can say, hey, honey, I'm like, honey, hey, can I say that thing that you said? You know, can I put that? And they're like, let me come read it. Like, I don't want to be misquoted. Um, but a child cannot consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is an issue of consent. And issues of consent are super, super, super important. And I thought about that a lot. I think the, the, the ethics of it are kind of forming and changing because like this was not an issue that existed before the public perception of what is private isn't there before the upside for me is that like my dad always used to take pictures of us and I never mind my sister hated it she's like mm, you know and and so she would tolerate this but then we ended up with pictures that now we look at and we're like oh look at how awful we dress and it was, it's, a, it's an archive, and what, I don't take pictures like that, but I tell little stories, and those stories are, that's like, that's a, a, a photo book for my kids. Maybe if I'm not around, they get to see how I saw them back in the day. Well, I think it's, I mean, as, as writers or artists of any kind, I think we've all got this sort of, like, monstrous part of ourselves that, you know, like, I mean, it's like the Nora Ephron, everything is copy thing. There's part mm. of you that understands that, like, from a completely bloodless point of view, it's all useful to you in some way. Um, and I think, if nothing else, the media has sort of turned us all into that monster, that everything is material for, some, for something that we are performing or putting into the world, right? Um, and I mean, there's a there's a whole lot of debate that you could have about, I mean, like, it's Sally Man, right? The photographer who takes pictures of her children in, in like, and her, her children are basically like her muses, and there's a lot of tricky things to say about you know consent and and representation of them as children, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing, and just just if you hadn't already gathered, I don't think there's going to be any answers. Like no, we have to like, solve this. Yeah, or like, or like, next how best, best practices. We've got 38 minutes and 30 right. seconds to figure this out. So I mean, maybe the best you might hope for is like. Um, I, I was talking to, oh boy, this, this, okay. I was talking to Neil Gaiman, and <laughs> I have, uh, okay, no wait, let me do it like a way better. So I was talking to Neil Gaiman, and uh, You didn't say my friend Neil Gaiman. My good friend, my good personal friend. We were talking in my tree fort where we hang out. And we hang out. 
Coco, and we play uh, Settlers of Catan all the time. And I get to be red because I love red. And uh, is he black? Wait, is uh, there black in Settlers? No. <laughs> we have special pieces made. It's okay. black pieces, and instead of with the uh, uh, the bandit, uh, you put uh, despair on their wings. <laughs> We could do a fucking Sandman Catan, couldn't we? Uh, oh no, no. Um, I don't understand these jokes at all. Trust me, that was very funny. Um, I to like five people out there, that was, their, that was their best part of the day. Uh, no, no, you encouraged me, it means us both. Um, What do you think oh, about Neil Gaiman? Now this panel's about Neil Gaiman, how about you love Neil Gaiman? Uh, I was hanging out with him and something had just blown up on him. And again, if you want an example, not that any of you need it, of how awful social media can be, a genuinely delightful, gentle and kind-hearted person like Neil, who, by the way, if you've wondered, if you've seen a video and you're like, oh, I wonder if he's really like that, or oh, he can't really, yeah, actually, he really is, like, all the way down to his bones, who just kind of, like, said a thing once on the internet, and then everyone's like, you are a monster, and because the internet is what it is these days, you know, he gets really bruised up by that. He's not invulnerable to, to feeling, here's a secret, like, these things don't scale. If you tell five of your friends something, or ten of your friends something, and one of them is slightly bitchy about it, then we're designed, like, physiologically to understand one person maybe being slightly brusque to us, but it does not scale at any meaningful level once you have, like, a thousand followers and then a tenth of a percent of them are a little snarky to you, and it's, it doesn't work. And with your Neil Gaiman, and all the people follow you, and you say a little thing that is in every way innocuous, that means a thousand people take it the wrong way and then write a blog post about it. And he was just, he was looking rough because he'd been put through the mill over this thing. And I told him, I'm like, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I go, if it's any consolation, I've been watching you as you move largely like with grace and style through social media and handle these situations well. You know, you're sort of ahead of me in the minefield and I make sure that I go around that spot. And he goes, he goes, well, huh, I'm glad someone's getting something out of it. <laughs> so like what I'm saying is here, the closest thing you might get to an answer is like, here's how we fucked up. Um, and the big thing for me I thought I was being smart. He said, you could get out in front of it. I was talking about my boys before they were born um, because I was online and my partner was pregnant and I was excited about that. And I tell stories about things that are on my mind. And, and then I posted a picture of him and somebody sent me a fan mail. This was back when I read every single fan mail. And they said, hey, I am a family attorney that deals with, I don't know, whatever the professional term is for egregious fuckery in relation to children. That's what it's called. Um, <laughs> I have there's IRTC. A, there's an acronym, yeah. Um, and he goes, if you're going to put a picture of your kid online, don't ever use it again. And I went, huh. And luckily I was safe because I didn't have his name finished until he was a month old. So I couldn't screw that up. It took me a month to name my child. Um, and so I did decide to keep referring to him with the, uh, the his, his belly name, you know, uh, which was Boot. And so a lot of you, who's heard this story about Boot, right? Um, here's the unintended consequence of that. I hear talking to people, I call him Boot, or I refer to my children as my boys. And there's some piece of me that, here to, because the information traveling the way it does these days, I know that if I fail once, that information will be out there. If I screw up and I use their real names, somebody can put that on Reddit, and I've, I've fucked it up forever. So I have to play a perfect game. 
And that means as I talk about my children publicly, I have an internal, like, fucking blast shield that comes down in my head every time I am speaking a sentence which might approach his name, and then I work around it. And those flinches do not go away when I go home. When I go home, or when I'm speaking to my friends or to my family about my child, I have to make sure that I refer to my boys and not his real name. Do you see where it is in each sentence where I could say his name? And I have this internal flinch, and this makes me feel deeply bad because I'm like, I, I have an aversion to my own child's name because I'm trying to do the good, careful thing and respect his privacy. And so, like, you said, if I'd been smart and I'd gotten out in front of it, you know, like, maybe it wasn't for the best for me internally. Um, now he's 10. Gosh, I'm doing it really consciously now. Um, also, like, we want to stream games together. Like, who's seen that charity stream with who? Yeah, like, if I'm streaming with him, he's pretty good about not referring to my littler, uh, not by name, but I can't trust the littler one to not, oh Jesus, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm going through like ice flows here. Um, you know, and then like, do I have, do I do my life on a three second delay? Do I have a red button by my Twitch stream and be like, oh no! You know, instead of saying motherfucker, it's like I, I've said a proper noun, and then I push the button and he cut the stream. No, you just have to rename the child every time you ask him. <laughs> I actually have chaffed a huge amount of disinformation into the internet. I've done a bunch of fake mistakes and reveals, so that a lot of people do think they know his real name, but what they know is one of the several fake things that I pretended to fuck up revealing. There's this old Superman comic where uh, Lex Luthor or Mr. Big Suplex or prints a million newspapers and said Clark Kent is Superman. So Superman cl cleverly prints a million other papers for every other resident of Metropolis and says, you know, Harry White is Superman, Jimmy Olsen is Superman. One of the things you can story. do with unlimited resources. <laughs> but you're doing the same thing, you've got the Clark Kent plan. I, what I have is potentially a disease, you know, <laughs> it's just overthinking and like really, I, I feel the need to play this perfect game because nothing's more important than my children. But also, I want to share them with the world because they're the best part of my life. Um, so I, I, I always do my best and I always feel like I'm fucking up. That's I'm not particularly famous, so like I put my daughter's social security number on my daughter, so like, I feel pretty okay with that decision. Um, I mean, the, the, the parenting side of it is kind of a very unusual subcase of this topic because you have a, a really important custodial relationship and responsibility there that's going to last a lifetime. Um, but in general, that's not the case. I mean, the weird thing about stories is they kind of belong to everyone who is in the story. And it's been true for, you know, centuries that people didn't like it when their relatives wrote about them. This, this is not a new problem. Yeah. I mean, Proust's family or, um, what's the name of the Norwegian guy, the My Struggle guy? Oh, uh, Carl of Nosgaard. Yeah, no, he's in some lawsuit because his uncle doesn't like how he comes off in those. And, right. But, you know, but that's a guy writing about his abusive dad, a thing he should be able to do, because those are your stories, you know? Well, it's like if you didn't want to be written about, you shouldn't have been born to me, You really shouldn't have dressed like that if you didn't want me to write about you in your cute diaper. Um, Whoa, well, that's like a very weird thing. Life changing, you know, good stuff. And I know there have, been, there have been some aspects of this that I have let go of, and when I let go of it, I feel huge relief. But I don't know if I'm actually engaging in correct action, or am I just stopping giving a shit about an important thing? I guess I'm asking you, the audience. This is Q&A the other way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Tell that he's a good dad, you guys. <laughs> in a lot of fuckitism in my personal and professional life. So it just kind of feels like, well, you know, the cat's out the cat's been out of the bag, so let's just let's just continue down this merry path. I hope nobody wants to steal my kid. Um, and I also feel like 
you know, she's again, she's seven, so I feel like I have a while before things really get like touchy with her peer group. I'm also assuming society's going to collapse before then, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I don't have to deal with the consequences of my action. <laughs> but I mean, it's true that even if society does stick around, we are building a generation that will think about privacy in a totally different way. Yeah. Them. Like, they, none of their peers will have any expectation that their life is not documented. You know, every equivalent of childhood photo albums or their early campus writings, all that will be 100% accessible to everyone. Yeah. So, we maybe we're the last ones who care. See, and, and here's, again, my disease. I'm like, well, sure, the world, but not me. You know, I, I absolutely feel that way. It's like, oh, sure, all other children, not mine. Like, I, I, feel, I will tilt at this windmill and die if I feel it's the ethically right thing to do. Um, and, and again, I, I really want to make it clear, if you're a parent doing something other than me, I am 100% not being critical of you. I'm saying, like, this is the way I am going, and I, I'm doing it because I feel like it's right. But that's, like, fucking my business. It's not something I'm proposing everyone do. I want to make that real clear, because... Apparently, I come off as real judgy sometimes, uh, because sometimes I am. Um, uh, do we want to hop off family? Or, uh, yeah, let's say, if this is, if, so if it's not a kid, what are our best practices? Do you guys get permission from somebody before you tell a story about them in print? 100%, unless it's John Stalton. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I had a conversation once with, um, like, AJ Jacobs, the Esquire guy that writes these kind of gimmicky experiential stuff, like he'll read the whole Britannica, or he'll follow every commandment in the Bible for a year. I don't know if you guys ever read any of these books. So it's, they're, they're very funny. But in, in a couple of these books, his brother-in-law comes across as a huge dick. Like, <laughs> it's all about him and his family. And generally, you know, he does the smart thing of it's his family reacting to how weird he is. That's always a safe story you can tell. You can always, like, I guess Mark Maron would say, why even punch down? You can just punch inward. Yeah. You know, like, Make, make yourself the butt of the joke. Holy shit, punching is, you don't punch yes. up, you don't punch down, you punch skin? Yes. One target. That's a horrifying, but it's true. Well, if you're a Mark Maron, it's a very target urgent environment. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in, in AJ's book, uh, he often does poke fun at his kind of dickish brother-in-law, who he makes no bones about disliking. And well, one time I asked him, I, I know AJ a little, I was like, so what did your brother-in-law think about the new book where he, like, he really seems like a smug a-hole? And he's like, oh, I got, a, I got a trick for that. And I said, what's the trick? And he said, the first time you mention somebody, say that they are attractive. Yeah. Like, so I guess the first time you mention his brother-in-law, he's like, he's a, you know, oddly attractive man in his, you know, thirties with a beauty, you know, a symmetrical yeah. features and a great smile, very handsome. That's definitely my policy with my daughter. My lovely daughter, Peter Benigan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and I guess he never had any backlash just because his brother-in-law loved the book. Hey, yeah. Uh, because right. you know, the first thing you see is, oh, I'm good looking. And, and then, then, then you close the book. <laughs> and you do a real good job, and it's like, ah, cool. Yeah, I generally subscribe to the It's Better to Beg for Forgiveness and Ask for Permission. Um, it's possibly not the best policy. Maybe I'll change everything right now. I, I, I mean, when I say yes, I always ask for permission, it's because most of the stories I tell are personal stories, so I already have my own consent for the most part. Um, but if what happened was I'm talking about a relationship moment, then I, I, I would talk with my partner about, you know, can I, are you comfortable with me telling the story? And then it's like, are you comfortable with my portrayal of you in here? And, and uh, Sarah would take a peek at it. Um, sometimes I would quote her directly. She had her own color font in the blog for a long time. Uh, but, uh, and then I extended that to uh, my assistant for a long time because I would tell stories about what would happen at a convention or at work. And so she would know like what was being said about her very specifically. But as I think about it, like if I would hang out, I joked about John, if I would hang out with someone professionally, and then I wrote about it. You know, if I wrote about it, there's different rules in my head. Um, as opposed to like, if I go on a podcast and I say, oh, this funny thing happened when I was hanging out with one of my best friends, Um Gaming. Uh, I, I would kind of tell that story, but all of those stories 
are a different story. That's it. You out in public doing usually something semi-professional with another professional. That's not what's happening in our house or in our friendship or in our life. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've had the experience of a friend telling me I, I wanted to interview him about something that a kind of a public spat that had happened online that there was documentation of. And he had put it all behind him and he was like, no, I'm not talking about that. And I was like, look, I'm writing this piece for Slate. It's part of the public record. I kind of feel like, like I'm a borderline journalist here and I have to write about this. And he said, well, I will regard that as an act of personal betrayal if you write about this public thing that happened. Although I will say, good job for him for absolutely saying clearly how he feels. Yeah, he has boundaries. Yeah, um, but sucks to lose that source, right? right? Yeah, I mean, it turned out like I had to decide, like, what matters to me more, like, writing this in the right way or this kind of tangential relationship? And then you're kind of thinking, is this guy a close friend? Do I think he's making the right call here? Like, like how much, uh, how much, um, what's the expression? I guess just how, how fungible is the relationship. I ended up not having enough room to get into it, so it ended up being a good thing. But I'd never run up against that before. Right. And it was a little daunting. Yeah. One of the, the things that's similar for me is this was a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, who knows uh, who's mom? Uh, Tara? Who yeah, knows who's mom? Uh, we were hanging out uh, at PAX East a couple of years ago, and she tweeted at me. Uh, something about Hufflepuffs, and then I tweeted back and made fun of Hufflepuffs in a, a really, it was some good jokes I made to make a lot of people real angry. And, uh, but they're Hufflepuffs, you know, like, oh no, oh no, it's like I'm being attacked by, are you retaking this grade? Is that what's happening? Uh, oh, there's pillows everywhere, I'm being attacked by pillows. Oh no, the Hufflepuffs, what are you going to do to me? Are you going to make me a cookie with slightly less chocolate chips in it? Um, <laughs> uh, <cute. laughs> oh, all the pages in the building right there, that's what I thought a Hufflepuff would give to um, So this is the fun that we had, two friends hanging out on Twitter together, and then like later she said, you know, you fucking rendered my Twitter unusable <laughs> for a week because all your fucking people are in it mouthing off about, I like, I can't read anything, I can't interact with my friends because, and so like, this is what I've had to come to grips with. I cannot interact with, like, you mere mortals <laughs> who actually engage in social media in a social way. I've had other friends say, please don't follow me on Twitter. Because like, the people that will just get at them, at the hope of being one step standing closer to me, is, is a non-zero amount. And so like, even that, like I don't get social, I've had one social media experience that's only been personal, and that happened a year ago, I got on Snapchat, which, I mean, welcome to the, to the 1990s. Um, I went on Snapchat and I have like 12 friends there, and it's neat. Uh, it's neat to only, to post something and only friends see, as opposed to like umpteen thousand kind of intimate strangers. You can also have a conversation with like your face. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's been my default until like you live alone in the small town in Stephen's Point. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you get your social where, where, where you can find it. It's true that when you have a big following, it's just, you know, not a common problem. But yeah, you get, you get all these side effects. You have to look in the mirror and say, oh, I have, I, Pat Rothfuss, have Bernie Bros, apparently. Um, you know, I have, I have people who are gonna, who are gonna follow in my wake and I can't be responsible for that. Well, and, and actually, I, I would say that people, all of my, my people that follow me or, or even look at me are, are beautiful, shining, delightful individuals. Um, uh, and actually, I said that kind of sarcastically. I have, I have so little trouble with my, my readership that it's, I feel kind of bad about it. Um, because there's people with smaller readerships that have much more trouble with like stalkers or assholes. Um, but there is this, this unintended consequence of even if a bunch of my people come in and be friendly, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. unscalable. Yeah. It does not scale in a, in a normal friendship way. It's not a cocktail party anymore at that level. You are deciding to speak to a, a stadium of, you know, 100,000 people. Yeah. Well, and a stadium of people who are protected by the barrier of not actually talking to you in person to just throw the worst that they can at you from, you know, behind the moat of anonymity or social media, whatever. So it's a weird, it's a weird way to have to think about interaction it's an entirely new setup for like that. Yeah. Uh, I the only um, tweet that I've ever made that went sort of properly viral was actually something about my daughter, which was and actually it was something she wrote. She had she had written these raps. She's seven, so they're not great. Um, but she had written them down like this is adorable and I took a picture of it and I put it on Twitter thinking, you know, like four or five people would be like, aw, she's cute. And all of a sudden there were like 21,000, you know, um, people talking about it and then like, you know, whatever robot trolls Twitter put it on time and I was like, oh, oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that was the first time that it really occurred to me like this is, this feels like a violation of her privacy. But I also was like, I can't tell her this is happening because she doesn't give a shit about her privacy. She likes attention. <laughs> and if I tell her she all of a sudden has a lot of attention, she's going to be like playing to that all. Oh, she's going to get really into that, which is also another like minefield to worry about. I think when you're talking, especially about kids, because they they don't have it in their head yet that they need to be protected from the world. They they just want you know likes. I'm really I'm what. I'm really proud of the fact that, like, my kids don't, for the most part, know that, I mean, we will occasionally watch a video, but they don't know that YouTube celebrities exist. Whoa, how did you do that? I guess it's too late for me. I told my daughter when she was two that YouTube was broken, and I haven't told her that it's back yet. We're still working on it, honey. Because look, she got super into those unboxing videos where, like, kids just, like, play with Play-Doh, and she would go so absolutely psychotic when I would take the iPad away that I was like, okay, first of all, I need, you know, I'd rather play on my phone, but I feel like there's something more immersive about an iPad, and then I got a more expensive one, and I'm like, you cannot touch this, it's, it's a very expensive piece of work equipment, um, but I realized that the way you watch YouTube is so, like, you know, it's like a rat, you keep hitting the, the pellet machine, and so, yeah, I, I, my policy with that, just as a sidebar, is like, you can watch anything that has a narrative, but I just don't want you watching, like, thing after thing of, like, people playing with Play-Doh. For, for me, I started, I started hardcore, I made a lot of people angry. My kids did not, I said, you can get my child a book mm -hmm. um, if you want to buy my child a present, but anything electronic or the, with a button you push that makes a noise, is not allowed. And some people are like, oh, ha, ha. I'm like, no, really, I will, I will donate it to charity, thank you very much. And they're like, ha, 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 ha. You know, like, they need to learn to exist in the world. And I'm like, well, no, actually, they don't. They need to learn how to interact with the world in good ways, and that's my job as a parent. So I kept them away from those sort of BB toys that are just like, I'm going to push it, it's going to play a thing. And instead, they learned different ways of interacting with the world. And then I carried that forward into like videos and whatever, I'll watch a video with them, but I curate that experience in the same way that I don't let them eat fucking hundred handfuls of sugar, even though they would really like that. All right, me, Dad. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a monster. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am a a fascist dictator of my my, my children's experience. Uh, that's not as funny a joke as it used to be. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm continually to told I'm the, we're the only, me and my wife are the only mom and dad who have these rules. Oh, do you have something similar? Oh, yeah, we have, we have no phone time, you know, no device time. We have, you know, we think of it as minimal restrictions. And of course, mom, you're, you're the only parent that does this, come on. And I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. running upstream. Listen, TV raised me, and if it was good enough for me, <laughs> it's good enough for my daughter. I, uh, I, uh, I had somebody come over, and this is quickly descending into kid talk, um, but I had somebody come over when my boy, I almost, there's a name moved ahead of me there, uh, when Oot uh, was like maybe two and a little bit of change, and a friend came over, and he came out and he was like, you know, like talking, and at the 60 second mark, 
he said something, and she went, and she looked at me like, because she had a five-year-old niece, and she's, and later she's like, my five-year-old niece doesn't talk like this. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, you talk to him like a grown-up, and he doesn't watch TV, um, when we read a lot of books. And I'm not saying that there weren't bad side effects to that, because he went to kindergarten, and the teacher's like, he's great. The other children don't understand him when he talks. <laughs> because he's talking at, he's just kind of talking like a grown up. He has this big vocabulary, he understands a lot of concepts. So, uh, I'm going to craft you a trophy for this humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> and that kid grew up to be John Hodgman. <laughs> um, and so, but like, here's the thing. Uh, at first I was like, yes, yes, my child is so clever and, and brilliant and everyone's so impressed. And then I'm like, God, have I kind of hobbled him socially? Like, he can't interact in this way. Like, I actually, I stood firm against Minecraft for a long time, or Pokemon, I'm like, and, and so like, you can see, like, at some point, yeah, I did make some good choices, maybe developmentally, but then also I was like, no, 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 my perfect precious child, I'm gonna wrap you in bubble wrap. Um, and uh, and now I'm, I'm starting to, to relax a little bit, but, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that I am going to tell my daughter when she's old enough to put things on the internet herself is that anything that she puts on the internet, she can expect that I'm going to read. You know, and if you want to keep something private, you put it on paper and you hide it under your bed. I'm still going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to think of everything that you put out there as belonging to the world at large. So, you know, how do you have typer, I guess. And here's one last one that I want to kind of bounce off you guys before before we move on to maybe a few general questions. Um, for me, I always I decided to when I was telling stories about my life, I always wanted to be honest with my readership about what my life was really like. And I talked about like I hit the New York Times list for my first book, and I like I did not feel good or excited, you know, and I was like. Well, shouldn't I feel good or excited? Like, shouldn't I be happy? Like, my life is really good on paper? Why, what's weird with me? And so I wrote a blog about it. I wrote many blogs about that. And people seem to like them, and I always want to be honest with everyone, including the people that I don't know that I talk to. And that works, again, fine when you're punching inward, but sometimes, if you're honest about an interaction you had with someone that was complicated, you know, how, do you guys, but also sometimes there's the temptation to fictionalize to make things interesting. Um, and so I've always chosen earnestness as like my brand, for lack of a better word. And that only works if it, you're just talking about yourself because you can tell all your own secrets and you can be truthful, but as soon as it bumps into someone else, that's why I haven't written in the blog for like three years, is like, I legally can't talk about Hollywood shit. And a lot of the other stuff that I'm going through, it's just, it's a bummer, or it's not polite to share. And so it's like, well, if I'm only telling the truth and I can't say something nice, I guess I gotta shut up on the blog. How do you guys deal with that? I mean, I don't, put a lot of filters on what I say, again, think about like, my own personal internal feelings um, because I'm a disgusting exhibitionist. Um, but I also have a huge fear of people being mad at me. So yeah, I tend to filter it towards like, something that really only involves me. I don't talk too much about personal interactions, especially if it's somebody who is also you know, in any way public or whatever. My husband could give two shits about me. <laughs> media. So if I say something about him, it, it lands differently than if it's somebody who like, can then step into the Twitter space and interact with me there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hate confrontation of all kinds, yeah. so it's very easy for me to kind of shy away from anything that might name names or put anyone I know in an unfavorable light. But like, I mean, thank goodness for people who don't do that, like how much great art has come out of people actually getting their family's squabbles down. Like, and, and at some point, that's just collateral damage. So your parents were mean, and their feelings were hurt when your book, the book came out. But then 10 million people read that book, and it changed their lives. Like, there's a utilitarian argument for pu pushing your 
pushing your friends and carrying them in the bus when they deserve it, you know? I did, right? Because I had I wrote a book about um, called um, that was awkward the art and etiquette of the awkward hug. So it's all it's like a taxonomy of, of awkward hugs basically, and the worst hug in the book is one that I got from my dad, <laughs> and I did not ask his permission. And then when it came out, I was like looking at it, like that's actually like I, I, if I were my dad, I might be a little put out by this. Um, but honestly, it's like that's a thing that happened. That happened to me. That's my experience that I own. And honestly, it's like 200 words, so he's going to... Well, and, and this is actually something that I, I talked about uh, with Hank Green, because he, again, huge social media following, um, and he was like, I don't know what to do, and I said, well, you know what it's really like is there's not parody, you're in a giant robot suit. Like, if you have a bunch of social media following, it's not like, well, there's my side of the story and there's your side of the story. Any slight movement you make backed by all of this social media power is like a giant robot moving through a city and a normal person's like, oh, I, like, there's some gravel under my foot, but like you step on a car, you knock over a building accidentally through these unintended consequences. David Sedaris, uh, who's read like, uh, or listened to Me Talk Pretty One Day, recently he came out and talked about how he published that story about this horrific French teacher he had, and everyone, it, it, it launched his career and everyone heard about it, but also, like, that woman stopped teaching because, like, everyone listened to that in, like, 30 languages, and he found out afterwards, and he's like, God, Actually, I just sort of selected a bunch of things that when you put them together, obviously she seems like a monster, but she wasn't just a monster. And so like he kind of robot, he like accidentally Godzilla that poor woman's life. Um, and uh, so anyway, everything you do will be wrong. Uh, I think it's the summation. Any quick questions? I, we, we, we have maybe five minutes left here. I would encourage you towards popcorn questions that might have short answers, not anything huge, no multi-part questions, like if you were an English teacher asking a student to write an essay. Uh, could you chat a little bit more? People who are deceased or that you don't have access to. Um, I always said, like, if you're an author, you don't talk shit about other authors publicly because it's just that form. But, like, you can make. But dead authors? But you can, you can make fun of Tolkien. Uh, because, like, you can't hurt him, you can't hurt his sales, he's dead. So I can make fun of some of Tolkien's writing style, and there's kind of no harm there. Um, it's, uh, look. I mean, I think if, they're, if you're going to speak ill of anybody, it should be the dead. <laughs> they're, they're fair game. If they wanted to not be in your book, they shouldn't have died. <laughs> <laughs> um, people who don't have access to... Like people from whom you're estranged? Right, family-wise. No, I think, you know, honestly, this is going to sound harsh, but if you're estranged from them, there's probably a reason, so fuck them. <laughs> and, and then, the only caveat I would say is there is a difference, like, again, for people that are at Church of the Infinite You, um, there's a difference between the person coming up, we all did fuck you, their dad. That's safe. That person, it was deceased and there's no, no way of that hurting that person. But again, like, if, if you are public or you have a huge social media following, you could really damage a person by, you know, by just saying, well, I'm just telling my side of the story. It could really ruin someone's life. Um, it's, it's not as simple as that, but it is something that you need to take into consideration. Uh, there's a difference between personal and a professional or who's a big public writer.
Um, do I use different filters in my writing versus my cartooning? Um, not necessarily. I mean, for the humorous stuff I do, it's just a completely different, you know, world. But like when I'm doing sort of like a personal essay thing or a personal comic, no, I don't think it's a, a matter of like what I choose to depict. It's more of a matter of how I choose to depict it. What was that? Uh, I'm not signing. Oh, uh, I think I'm signing later today, don't I? I would have to consult with the schedule to answer that question. So, I mean, if you show up to Rock this after dark, I'll sign something. Uh, but but uh, we only have two minutes here to deal with questions for this panel. Right there. Yeah. At what age does a child become sentient? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> well, for, if it was an AI, it would be when it got the launch code. So, <laughs> whenever your child does the equivalent of launching a nuclear strike, and then they look different depending on your key. Yes, yeah, six, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, I ask more and more, like, would you like to do this? Are you comfortable with this? Can I share this story with... I usually say, can I share this story with my friends? which is a little disingenuous. Um, but honestly, I don't, uh, what I keep from my children also is the fact that I am, by some metrics, famous. Because I don't want them to think of me like that. I want to be their dad. Um, and so I, you know, and in some ways I do think of my readership as my friends, which is an whole other thing that isn't true. Uh, but I think it, it's not a moment, it's a sliding scale of decision making. Last chance for questions. You're gonna have to really belt it out. That's okay, I have a big voice. Yeah. So to repeat that, apparently in France, under 13, a child cannot consent. They can't be, you they said, on the internet. But, but like you can't post pictures of them or anything. That, I had no idea that was the case. Yeah. That's why I don't post photos of my dogs. They can't consent to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, final seconds, final questions. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you. Too. Anything you guys are doing in the United States you want to mention? Going once, going twice. Uh, you can buy my book in the shop. Oh, buy the book in the shop, everyone. You can hey. all about my dad's hug. <laughs> Thanks again.